you need to hear the real reason that SVB and these other banks have failed because it tells a much different story than what you've already heard on CNBC and from these other talking heads here on YouTube. About a week ago, this bank, Silicon Valley Bank, was taken over by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is basically the government entity that is regulating these banks. And why did that happen? We can see here back in November of 2022 that the FDIC was worried about growing unrealized losses in banks' bond portfolios. So basically, a bunch of these banks went out and they bought bonds and other mortgage-backed securities from the federal government. And then as the Federal Reserve raised interest rates over this last year, all of those bonds and mortgage-backed securities became worth much less money than what those banks purchased them for. And it's at this point, I think people hear talking heads and they hear people like me say mortgage-backed securities and federal bonds and other shit like that. It's like, what the does that even mean? And so I'm going to take a page out of Martin Shkreli's book. He actually did a really interesting video that I'll leave a link to down in the description where he went through line by line and analyzed the balance sheet of one of these banks and then showed you guys why it's going to fail. And so next, let's go ahead and take a look at First Republic Bank as of March 12th, 2023, which is about a week before I'm recording this video. A week ago, their stock price was around $81. And as of today, it's only trading for about $23. So there's a massive 83% drawdown over this last week or so. Banking is a very simple business. It's not like Tesla or Apple or one of these high flying tech companies that's hoping to like a thousand X their valuation. Banking is very simple. It's how much money do we have in the bank? How much money have we given out in loans? What is that difference? Where are we making the interest? How much cash do we have on hand, et cetera, et cetera. And so if we go through and look at First Republic Bank here, we can see that a week ago, the price of the stock was $81 per share. There were about 186 million shares outstanding, and there was a market cap of about $15 billion. And so now if we go through the assets and the liabilities of this bank, based on what they were reporting in their 10K, which is just a filing that the bank has to do every quarter, we can see that they had about $4 billion of cash. They had about $3 billion of debt that is available for sale. They had $28 billion, so a lot more of debt that is hold to maturity. And there's a big difference here that we'll talk about in a second. They had $166 billion of outstanding loans. So remember, when you get a loan from the bank, if you go to the bank and say, hey, I need $300,000 to buy a house, if they loan you that $300,000, that loan is an asset to the bank because you're going to be paying them back that $300,000 plus interest over time. But that loan is not guaranteed there's no guarantee that the bank has that you're actually going to pay them back that $300,000 over time. That's just what they're writing on their balance sheet for all of their total loans outstanding and how much money they're expecting to get back. It is again, not money that they have right now. They have a little bit of money in life insurance and tax credits and PP&E and Goodwill and other, and I don't really know like what would go into the category of other. I'm a very you know novice accountant here, but I think that this paints a really good picture. You can see that really their cash on hand is this cash and this debt here of about $7 billion, right? So we've got like $7 billion of cash on hand. We've got this $28 billion that we can't really do anything with because it's hold to maturity. And then we've got this $166 billion of loans that we're expecting to get back someday, but that we can't just actively get rid of right now. So now that we've gone through the assets of the bank, let's talk about the liabilities here. The biggest liability of a bank is the money that you're depositing into the bank. So if you have $3,000 in your checking account, that's your money, but to the bank, it's not an asset, it's their liability because they at any point need to be able to give you back that $3,000. So out of all of the deposits in the bank, there's this non-interest bearing, checking, money market, and COD. The bank has about $176 billion of deposits and then they have about $18 billion of debt and other liabilities. And now we can calculate this book value at the bottom here by taking the total number of assets minus the total amount of liabilities and we end up with a book value of about $18 billion or $17 billion. So we can see that already last week, the book value of the bank was higher than the market capitalization of the bank, which was showing people that like, uh oh, something's going wrong here. Because in reality, the bank shouldn't really ever trade below their book value. But what happened last week was investors started to see this debt hold to maturity of $28 billion on the balance sheet here. And they started to say, wait a minute, is that $28 billion really worth $28 billion anymore? And that brings us back up here to this unrealized gains or losses on investment security. This $28 billion, that might be what it's worth when you've held your bond for four years or five years or whatever the length of the bond was. But once the Fed drastically and sharply raised interest rates here in 2022, those bonds that were worth $28 billion, if you held them all the way to maturity, were no longer worth $28 billion. And instead, those banks had 
a massive unrealized capital loss on those bonds because as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And so if we come back to the balance sheet here of First Republic Bank, we can see this column here that we just talked about, their Q4 in millions of dollars that was shown on the balance sheet. But then right next to it, we can talk about what the reality of the situation was. And the reality of the situation is that this debt hold to maturity is not actually worth $28 billion. Just because $28 billion is what you would get if you held that debt to maturity, if you marked that debt to market right now, it might only be worth something like $19 billion. And these numbers are not exact, but it's directionally accurate to show you a picture of kind of what was happening in these banks. And so now by just marking down that hold to maturity debt, we can see that the total assets of the bank have fallen, but the total liabilities of the bank, those deposits that you have put into your checking and savings accounts are exactly the same. And so what happens when the assets fall, but the liability remains the same, it means that the book value has to also fall. And so now the book value of the bank is only, you know, $9 billion and the market cap was $15 billion. And so when the market cap is higher than the book value of the bank, the stock price needs to go down where today, obviously now we're trading closer to $20 than we are to $80. And this scenario here is a very unemotional look at this company's balance sheet. But if we come down here and we introduce a little bit of fear into the equation, we can see that the debt and the cash are really the only things that they can immediately use to start paying out depositors. So if a bunch of depositors see that the stock of their bank was $80 a couple days ago, and now it's only $20, the depositors might go to the bank and say, hey, I want some of my liabilities from the bank. I want some of my bank deposits back because I don't really trust you guys to manage my money anymore. And so unfortunately, the bank only has this cash and this debt that they can immediately call on to start to repay depositors. They might be able to sell some equities, but they might lose money on it. They might be able to sell a portion of their loan book to another bank or something like that, but they might only get 80% of the value of those loans because the other bank doesn't want to take on the counterparty risk. They might be able to sell 50% of their life insurance terms or their tax credits or their PP&E or their goodwill, but really who knows how liquid or how accessible any of this money is. And so the other place that they had to look to was this debt hold to maturity. And now when they go to start to sell some of that hold to maturity debt, they're realizing even more losses. And now maybe when you go to sell that debt, it's worth even less than your calculation that you did before had suggested that it would be worth. And so now if we come all the way back here, this is no longer an unrealized loss on investment securities. This is now just a straight up loss on investment securities, which is what the FDIC was worried about all the way back in November of 2022. And I think up to this point, everyone is on the exact same page about what happened here. But now we start to get into whose fault this was. And there's very key pieces of information that a lot of people that are talking about this story are just completely leaving out of the story. So the sort of standard take on this is like, oh, well, if you were a bank, like what an idiot you are to have bought all of this hold to maturity debt that like you couldn't access for four years when you knew you had all of these depositors that you needed to pay back at theoretically any moment. Why would you lock up all of this money and hold to maturity debt when that greatly outweighs the amount of deposits that you're responsible for immediately giving back to bank customers? So there's that whole argument from all of these people on Twitter and they're like, ha ha ha, bankers are so stupid. You know, if I did this, I would have not done it that way. I'm such a genius, right? And I think that that's like a really dumb way to think and is coming from people that quite frankly are not bankers and probably would make the exact same decisions if they were put in the exact same circumstances that these bankers were put into. And it comes back to this interest rate calculation here. All the people on Twitter, ha ha ha, like you didn't hedge your interest rate risk. You didn't think that the Fed was going to hike interest rates faster and higher than they ever have in the history of the United States. How could you be so stupid? And I'm not here to be like Mr. Defend the Banks, right? Like I think, you know, fractional reserve banking is really stupid and fundamentally broken. But if we come down here and we just do like the slightest bit of homework, we can see that when those banks bought those long duration bonds that they had to hold to maturity on their balance sheets that we just talked about, the Fed was projecting that in 2022, interest rates would be below 1%. In 2023, interest rates would be below 2%. And that longer term after 2023 into 2024, the highest interest rates would get would only be 3%. And if we zoom out and we come back here, we can see that interest rates are not at 1% in 2022. They're not at 2% in 2022. They're not at 3% in 2022. They're closing in on 5% at the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023. And so when 100% of the Fed presidents said that rates would be under 1.75% until 2023, that turned out to be complete 
And this guy's completely correct. This is exactly what's going to happen when a completely inept and unaccountable institution has been given a monopoly on money printing in America or anywhere else for that matter. So is this the fault of the banks? Should they have had all of this held to maturity debt? Yeah, of course not. They like clearly if they had not done that, you know, they would have been able to satisfy even more depositors with, you know, a regular short-term debt and they wouldn't have blown up from all of this long-term hold to maturity debt. Definitely really bad risk management from the bank. Definitely don't put all of your money into hold to maturity debt when, you know, your depositors could come asking for way more money than that tomorrow. Haha, ha, dumb idea, duration mismatch, like banks are idiots. Great. We're all happy now. We made fun of the bankers. It's the Fed's fault, guys. Yes, bankers should manage risk better, but when the Fed artificially manipulates the cost of capital, something is going to break, especially when they explicitly gave guidance saying that they were not going to do what they then went and did. If you're a banker back in 2021 and you see that interest rates are going to be under 1.75% until 2023 here, of course you're going to buy bonds way out here for 2%, right? Because that's going to be more than what the Fed presidents said the interest rate was going to be in 2023. But then what happened instead is that here in 2022, the Fed didn't hike to 1%, they hiked up to 5%, which is not even on this graph. This graph ends at 3%. They would be all the way up here off this graph up at 5% in 2023. And now these people are way underwater. They just got like totally destroyed because this whole area under the curve is like now money that they don't have anymore, right? Oh, buy the bonds. It'll be safe. 1.75% interest rates. And then it's like, nope, you rug pulled 4.75% interest rates, unrealized losses on investment securities. And this is not just a first Republic bank, whatever Silicon Valley bank problem. This is everyone made these same decisions and the FDIC knew about it back in November again for the 15th time. So what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next is that Credit Suisse and all of these other bigger banks that did the exact same thing that First Republic Bank and all these other banks did where they bought all of this debt that was hold to maturity and now they have a duration mismatch and their stock price is going to crash all because the Fed raised interest rates. These companies are going to go out of business or be acquired for pennies on the dollar by other banks that are either being subsidized by the Federal Reserve or in this case the Central Bank of Switzerland. And that's going to lead to a banking environment where maybe right now in the world, there's like 500 banks for you to choose from. In the future, there's going to be half as many that you can choose from because all of these giant banks have now acquired all of these other giant banks. Consolidation happens and now there are fewer options for you to bank anywhere in the world. I'm recording this on the weekend so you can actually see this live here. Credit Suisse is not trading yet because it's Sunday, but you can see that their current stock price gives them a market cap of $8 billion, but they've been acquired by UBS for only $2 billion. So UBS basically was like, hey, Credit Suisse, we checked out your financial statements up here. And it turns out they look super similar to First Republic Bank, where there's either a debt duration mismatch or your loans are not really worth right now what you're saying they might be worth in the future. And so because of how toxic your assets are, we're only willing to pay $2 billion for your business that is currently valued by the market at $8 billion. So they're pricing in that once the stock market opens on Monday, so many people would sell Credit Suisse that it would go down another 75%. And so of course, the solution to all of this is not bailouts and, you know, put your money in banks, it's be your own bank, right? Get a cold card, put some Bitcoin on the cold card, put the seed phrase in your head and on a metal piece of paper. This isn't the last time that this is going to happen. These are the third and fourth and probably fifth largest bank failures of all time. They're still smaller than the bank failure in 2008, but this will not be the last bank that fails. And more and more people are starting to wake up to the fact that, yeah, Bitcoin's really volatile, but the system works. There is no fractional reserve. I can hold my keys on this cold card and some banker in Switzerland Switzerland is not going to that up for me. Bitcoin's price is very volatile, but the system works. Whereas the banking system is very stable until it isn't. Something else I took note of this week is just how many of these altcoins are trading as Bitcoin derivatives. So you'd say Bitcoin cash, that's a Bitcoin derivative. All right, whatever. What's your point? I think the really interesting one here is Filecoin, right? Filecoin is meant to be this like decentralized way to store files or something stupid like that. Why is it that a D 
decentralized file storing system would be pumping 15% in a week on the news that banks are failing. It just was a great illustration to me that these tokens are trading based on fundamentals that just don't exist, right? Like why is it that Filecoin should trade 15% higher in a week that banks failed? Other than that, Bitcoin went up 36% in the same week. If we go look at Dropbox stock, really like Filecoin should be a derivative of Dropbox stock, not of Bitcoin, right? So for me, weeks like this where Bitcoin massively outperforms and decouples itself from the altcoin market, it really solidifies to me that all of these tokens are just trading as derivatives of Bitcoin and they'll continue to do that until they don't. And when they don't and when there is that real split between Bitcoin and all these other tokens, that's not gonna be like happy days for all of these people who are holding a bunch of Aptos and Stellar and Filecoin and Lido DAO. Because at the end of the day, if you look at any altcoin chart in Bitcoin terms, they all look pretty similar to this where there's one big spike, people go, all right, Filecoin, it's the future of finance, like this is it, right? And then over time, they all start to trade down and down and down to the right versus Bitcoin, and they start to approach zero. Will they ever get to zero? Who knows? But I'm not going to be like sitting here buying Filecoin waiting to find out. I think we are going to see more of these fractional reserve blowups in the future. I think it's a matter of when, not if, because it's becoming more and more clear to me that this is really a feature of fractional reserve lending and not a bug, right? You can't stop this from happening. It's very obvious why it is happening. But I do think one thing that we can do to stop it is to opt into a new form of money that is based on debit instead of credit. And if you guys have any questions about anything that I covered in this video, definitely let me know down in the comments and check out this video up here to learn more about my thoughts on Bitcoin. I love you all. See you next week.